we turn this evening to 1 Kings chapter 18, which we read a little bit earlier in our service. And from the reading of that chapter, you will know that it was a very dramatic day indeed at Mount Carmel. After a three-year-long period of drought in which the land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey and rivers and fountains, was turned into a desert. And the prophet who had called that famine three years previously turns up again and shows himself to Ahab and to all Israel. His purpose is to propose a contest. The true God against the false God Baal that was worshipped among God's covenant people. And so Elijah would represent the Lord and the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, together with 400 prophets of the grove, would represent the false gods. The proposal went like this, that each would prepare their sacrifice, that they would call upon the name of their God, and the true God would manifest himself to be such by answering with fire from heaven. Well, of course, the Lord Jehovah won. And the people of Israel were brought to confess and own the Lord again. If you look at uh, Elijah's prayer in verse 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. <coughs> Elijah then has the prophets of Baal killed. We're not told anything there about the prophets of the groves, whether or not they were included with them. But these false prophets were killed. Now that is, in and of itself, all very climactic. However, the climax is yet to come. Because in verse 41 to 46, the God who answers and vindicates himself and his prophet by fire will now answer and vindicate himself and his prophet by water, by reversing the three-year drought that has been upon the land of Israel. He does it again in response to prayer. Looking to the Lord this evening for help, we want to consider this portion and the Lord's answer by water with this intent that you and I may learn principles that are going to help our own faith and prayer life. So the theme is the answer by water. Note, first of all, the ground of prayer. The ground of prayer. In verse 41, uh, Elijah speaks unto Ahab. Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink. And he supplies this reason, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Now, if you had listened at the point at which Elijah spoke those words, you wouldn't have heard anything. But yet the prophet knows that the rain is coming, and it is as if by faith he can hear it coming. And so Ahab goes up to eat. And in verse 42, Elijah goes to prayer. Now here's our question. How can it be in verse 41 that Elijah is so confident that the rain is going to come? So confident indeed that he will say, I can hear it. There's a sound of abundance of rain. Well, some will say it was because he was a prophet, and at that moment he got some secret prophetic uh, revelation given to him that he would in turn communicate to Ahab. Others believe it was a kind of holy instinct. Now we'll stop there, because believers do have such holy instincts. The Lord can come by his spirit, and he can impress certain things upon our hearts so that we get a sense of something possibly going to happen. The Lord has done that many times throughout history. The problem with the modern charismatic is he links that kind of thing to the charismatic gifts in the New Testament period. 
maybe you've experienced something like that yourself. The Lord has given you an impression, almost like a premonition, of something that was going to happen. But here's the issue with that. You would never turn around and say that it was going to happen with prophetic certainty. Another thing to note is that our holy instincts are very often due to our being steeped in the word of God. And we don't necessarily know why, but our thinking is governed, our understanding is regulated by the word of God. And when we find ourselves in a particular circumstance, we instinctively know or expect something. And it's not some supernatural revelation that's been given to us. It's just our mind and our heart governed by the word of the Lord so that we have biblical expectations. So we can have holy instincts. But none of these two things really supply the answer to our question. How can Elijah be so confident? Well, the context supplies its own answer. And the reason that Elijah could say this is because of what God actually said and what God actually did. So we find here that Elijah is confident in the divine promise. If you were to go back three years previous, the prophet comes with the message of the Lord and he says, it's not going to rain in Israel for the space of three years. And it won't rain again until the Lord speaks to you by my mouth. And for three years, Elijah kind of disappears. He goes for the time and he lives by the brook Kareth and the Lord supplies his needs there. And then the brook dries up and he heads north to the region of Zidon, to a place called Zarephath, and he remains there with a widow for a period of time. But look what we're told in verse 1 of chapter 18. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, now listen, and I will send rain upon the earth. Well, what did Elijah do? He got up, he went, he showed himself unto Ahab and to all Israel. They had this contest at Mount Carmel and he believed the word of the Lord. That the Lord said, if you do that, Elijah, I will send the rain upon the earth. It's time. And so Elijah here is simply believing and exercising confidence in the divine promise. But he's also understanding, I believe, the significance of what happened at Mount Carmel. So God said, I'll send the rain. But Elijah understands what has just happened there upon that mountain as to and also why God will now send the rain. You see, this drought came upon Israel because of their sin and notably their sin of idolatry. And Elijah, as God's prophet, comes to Israel and prosecutes the covenant of the Lord to them. That was the function of these prophets. Here's God's word. God was to, or Israel was to live according to the terms of God's covenant. And the prophet is like an attorney, if you like, on God's behalf. And he's prosecuting God's covenantal claims upon his people. Well, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28, where the detail of that covenant is given. And you've got blessings and cursings enumerated here. Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, the Lord says, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Among these curses we find verse 23 and 24. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass. And the earth that is under thy feet, under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. So one of the covenantal curses for the sins of God's people was that the Lord would stop the heavens. God brought that down upon Israel in the days of Elijah. 
and for three years they've been languishing under God's covenantal curse. But what happens at Mount Carmel? Elijah proposes the contest. The result is going to be God bringing the rain. And in that contest, God accepts the sacrifice that Elijah offers upon the repaired altar of the Lord, built with 12 stones, each representing one of the tribes of Israel. He accepts that sacrifice sovereignly by sending down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice himself. And on the basis of that, the prophet's prayer is answered, that the hearts of God's people were turned unto the Lord, and they profess in repentance and faith, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. Then the idolatrous priests and everything that they represent are put to the sword of divine justice. And the problem of sin is largely rooted out. Now, not completely. That old devil Jezebel is still there in the palace of Jezreel. But you see, this is a period of reformation. Where God accepts Israel's sacrifice at the end of a period of covenant curse. And he's going to bring on the back of that covenant blessing once again. Elijah understood this. And so his confidence is rooted in the divine promise and he understands the significance of karma. I would simply say to you this evening that you and I pray on the same ground that Elijah prayed at Mount Carmel. Sacrifice for sin. Is that not our sole confidence as we come to the Lord in prayer? That the fire that should have fallen upon us, God's divine vengeance against our sin, has fallen upon the substitute, the sacrifice, our Lord Jesus Christ. And in his death, he has removed the curse of God for our sins from upon our persons. And as we come like Israel in repentance and faith, our hearts being turned unto the Lord, we come in this confidence that he accepts the sacrifice according to his divine promise and we, his people, receive blessing upon that basis. So we are taken at Mount Carmel to the same grounds of prayer that you and I must pray to God upon today. But not only do we pray upon the, great, the same ground being sacrifice for sin, we also pray upon the same ground of God's promise. Remember what we said. The Lord actually told Elijah what he was going to do. But Elijah doesn't think, well, God has said what he's going to do, and that's fine. I don't therefore need to ask him to do it. Rather, we find him in this portion. Coming, and we'll see just how fervently, but coming with urgency and fervency to ask the Lord to do the very thing that he promised to do. Do you realize as a Christian tonight that that is how prayer works? That we don't go asking God for all of our little whims and desires and the things that we think would be best for us. But we actually take what God has said he will do and what is good for us. And we return it unto the Lord in prayer, knowing that the God who has appointed the end, the thing that he's going to do, has also appointed the means, that is the way that he's going to do it. And it has pleased the Lord, even though he doesn't need our prayers, to call us to the place of, place of prayer in order that he might fulfill his own will. So we come to him through Christ on the promises that he has given to us in his word, knowing that God wills to give us in answer to our asking him for the thing. 
Now, these can be great things. Think of everything that the Lord speaks about his kingdom, the parables of the kingdom. Remember the parable of the mustard seed. It's, it's so small and it grows surprisingly large. And the birds of the air, they come and they make their nests in its branches. Something so surprising. The Lord says, my kingdom's like that. It's going to start from a tiny beginning, a few apostles in the city of Jerusalem, and it's going to spread to the ends of the earth, and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. God says, I'm going to do that, and the disciples say, teach us to pray, and he says, when you pray, pray, thy kingdom come. Well, Lord, you've already said it's going to come. Never you mind about that, says the Lord. I'm telling you, this is how it's going to come. My people are going to come to my throne and they're going to beg of me according to my revealed will. That's true of the great things of God's kingdom. But it's also true of all the smaller things in your life, the way the kingdom of God comes in our experience. The way the Lord gives us faith and repentance and subdues our hearts unto him and increases his work in our lives so that we might be more sanctified and holy. The kingdom of God comes like that. And we pray similarly, thy kingdom come with respect to our own lives. You see, the Lord may give without our asking. He may. But you and I have absolutely no reason to expect it. The precursor to obtaining blessing, according to scripture, is to take the promise that God has given us, our hearts being stirred to pray, in order that we might receive. Now I put this challenge to you this evening. If you are not praying, if we are not praying as a congregation, how do you ever expect to receive the blessings of God? The ground of prayer here being the divine promise and the significance of the sacrifice at Carmel. They drive us to Christ to plead God's promise that God would do his will as we ask him to do it. So that's the first thing, the ground of prayer. <coughs> Secondly, we have features of prayer. Ahab goes to eat, and I imagine in one sense he's really quite thankful to still be alive because his wife's prophets have all just been put to the sword. And as Ahab goes up to eat, Elijah turns to pray. And in verse 42 and 43, we have a number of features that characterize his prayer. And so Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. The features that I want you to notice are three. First of all, the place. Where does Elijah pray? Well, we're told in verse 42, that when Ahab went up, very likely to his tent, to eat and drink, Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Now it's not a really high mountain. But why did he go to the top of the hill? Well, very likely because on the one hand, it gave him a vantage point so that he could look out over the Mediterranean Sea to observe whether or not there was any sign of rain coming. But then on the other hand, it was a very busy day at Mount Carmel, wasn't it? There were 850 false prophets alone. All Israel had gathered there to behold that <coughs> contest. And so when we're told that Elijah goes to the top of Mount Carmel, it's very likely that he goes there to seek solitude in order that he can pray before God. 
Now that's significant for us this evening because there's a time to pray in public. And we see Elijah doing that earlier before the whole congregation. Verse 37, he cries to the Lord, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God. That's public prayer. But now he retires before the Lord in private. You see, it's good for us to come and pray in public. There are many reasons why we should do so, not least that the Lord promises to be with us and hears our agreed prayers. But it's vital that you and I pray in private. That you have set times and regular times of personally wrestling with God. Now you don't have to go up to the top of a hill. The Bible speaks of this solitude and prayer in many different ways you can go out into the wilderness as Jesus did with his disciples to try and get rest or you could go into the closet and seek there the Lord in the privacy of your own closet (coughs) the principle is the same though get yourself a place and a time and get alone (coughs) to wrestle with God But then the second feature is the posture. Verse 42, And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm not saying that this is the way you have to pray. But it is significant. (coughs) It's like he's in a fetal position, but yet propped up upon his knees. He's cast himself before the Lord and he's hunched over in such a way that his forehead is approximately upon his kneecaps. I want you to get that image in your mind because a few moments before he was in front of a huge audience standing tall, publicly seeking the face of God. Now, He's in the posture of abasement, dependence, and humility before the Almighty. Don't let the force of that miss you this evening. Here is a great man humbling himself before a greater God. Here is a man who has seen so much in his ministry. A man who stopped the heavens three years before through prayer. And he could have been going around for the next three years, puffing his chest out, patting himself on the back and thinking, I'm quite a prophet really. There hasn't been many guys like me in the history of Israel. He's the man who moments before we said stood tall before all and he routed the prophets of Baal and made a spectacle of them. He's just called fire down from heaven, children. But here's the measure of the man. I need to get alone with God and there I'm going to abase myself in his presence. Because I did none of this in my own strength and power. No, on the contrary, I'm nothing before him. If the great prophet Elijah could pray like this before God, how much more you and I? In many respects, it's the measure of this man. It's the secret of his success. James says he was a man subject to like passions as you are. And yet he humbled himself before Almighty God in the secret place. His outward posture manifesting the inward disposition of his heart. Lord, I'm empty. Lord, I'm helpless. Lord, I'm totally dependent upon you and your strength for everything. you do realize I trust that the secret to his success is likewise the secret to the success of every believer who prevails with God in prayer. 
And you see it here outwardly in the posture that he adopts before God. So are you getting alone with God? I don't say you have to adopt this posture outwardly. But you must adopt this posture inwardly. So we have the place and the posture. But note thirdly here the persistence. Elijah is there with his face in his knees. His servant is in the vicinity. And as he prays, he sends his servant to look across the Mediterranean for a sign of an answer to his prayer. The servant goes away. He returns the first time. And Elijah says, is there anything? And the answer comes back, there is nothing. And he sends him another six times, that is seven times in total. And six times the answer comes back, nothing. And yet Elijah prays on. Six nothings. And yet Elijah plays, prays on. You see here something that you know already as Christians. And that is that sometimes God would have you wait for an answer to prayer. There's not this uniform rule of the way God answers prayer. Or how long you will pray for before the Lord gives you an answer. And you see that in this chapter, don't you? Verse 37, he's earnestly praying and he says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me. Turn the hearts of this people again. Answer my prayer. Vindicate your name. And there's no delay. When Elijah prays, it's not like the prophets of Baal who start in the morning and go through noon and get more and more frantic and start cutting themselves. And heaven is silent. When Elijah begins to pray at the time of the evening sacrifice, the answer is returned immediately. But not now. Now he will pray and send the servant six times and six times no sign of an answer. Sometimes God will have you to wait. And if God has you to wait, he requires you to persist in believing prayer. He requires you to persist in believing prayer. You see, Elijah believed that though he had to wait, the Lord was not deaf. <coughs> Think about it in agricultural terms. If we were to imagine prayer is like sowing before the Lord. Who imagines that the harvest is going to come immediately the seed is sown? Sometimes that's the way prayer works. We go before the Lord and we sow our seed in prayer and the Lord would have us wait before we reap the harvest. Or as another author says, we don't imagine that we go to God as though our prayers were Lord's to direct him according to our sovereignty. But rather, when we go there, he would have us understand that he's Lord, who sometimes requires his servants to wait, knocking at the door. But we shouldn't imagine for a moment that somehow God is deaf to our, our cries. I wonder then this evening, if you're being honest, with yourself before the Lord. What would you have done with those six nothings? Especially when you'd made such a proud declaration to Ahab, get thee up Ahab, eat and drink, there's a sound of abundance of rain, and one time, two times, three times, oh dear, there's no rain, four times, five times, six times. What would you have done and what you would you have thought with all those nothings? I think if truth be told, sometimes we would have got the first nothing and we would have thought, huh, well, huh, that's what I expected in the first place. And we would have stopped right there and then because our faith is not active. <clears throat> 
But Elijah teaches us that God will have us to wait in prayer. And as we wait, we believe. And as we believe, faith sends our hope out like the servant of Elijah asking us there's, if there's any sign of our answer. So we have this ground of prayer and then these features of prayer. But finally, we have the answer to prayer. The seventh time, the report comes back. And the servant of Elijah says in verse 44, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And that was it. We'd very likely still be doubting, but not Elijah. Elijah believes that that is all the evidence that he requires. He's assured that God has answered. He goes back down the mountain. He speaks to Ahab. Stop eating now, Ahab. It's time for you to get into your chariot and make your way home because there's such a, a downpour of rain coming that you'll need to be home before it hits the highway. That's the idea here. Ahab gets into his chariot. He doesn't invite Elijah to ride with him. Maybe he should have. But Elijah girds up his loins and runs before Ahab. Like a servant of the king. All the way back to Jezreel. There really is wonderful grace shown to Ahab here. I mentioned earlier, he could have counted himself very fortunate that day to be left alive because of all of his wicked idolatries. All these false prophets were slain. That should have spoke to this man. God has spared his life though he is leading his nation in wickedness. And God is continuing to speak to him and lead him by the prophet Elijah. There's grace to, wait to Ahab in this. But if we move away from Ahab and just think about Israel, there was life for Israel, wasn't there? That's what this answer constituted. Three years of drought. Obadiah is sent out by the king to try and find some river, some fountain, some oasis where there was still moisture that had vegetation that might be able to feed some of his livestock. The whole country is perishing. Remember the widow in Zarephtha. She's up in the north, even over the border of Israel. And she's getting ready to die. She's got nothing left. The Lord's blessing through Elijah sustains this woman and her meal and her oil does not run out. But now the rain is beginning to fall. God is really sending life from heaven. Well, there's Elijah on Mount Carmel and he looks out and he sees the cloud the size of a man's fist. And in that he sees the seed of everything God is going to do. To turn their barrenness into fruitfulness again. Well, of course, the Lord is the one who sends rain and gives to us all of our natural blessings. But what's going on here is spiritual. It's covenant cursing and it's covenant blessing. And the illusion in this whole pa in this whole passage with his significance in the history of redemption, is pointing forward to a greater act that the Lord will perform, not at Mount Carmel, but at Mount Calvary. You see, you have sacrifice at Carmel, after which water is poured forth from on high. And when you come to the New Testament, God answers by fire in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He removes the curse of our sins. And then our Lord Jesus Christ ascends to the right hand of the Father and he <coughs> pours out the living water that he speaks of himself. He pours out the Holy Spirit, the life-giving Spirit, 
upon his church to the ends of the world. And listen, when the Lord withholds that blessing, when the Lord withholds the blessing of his Holy Spirit, the consequence is spiritual barrenness, famine, and death. And at such times, the people of God come like Elijah and they beseech the Lord, crying out of that spiritual <coughs> drought, that the Lord would come and send that rain for, from heaven once again. That shouldn't be lost upon us this evening. <coughs> if you look into your own heart right now, what do you find? Do you find spiritual fertility, fruitfulness in life? Or do you find the desert and barrenness that Israel in this portion of God's word describes? Be honest with yourself before God. What grows in the soil of your soul? Well, if you're concerned about that, concerned about it to any degree this evening, the only thing that's going to solve the problem is Jesus Christ pouring out his Holy Spirit upon your life. And the good news of the gospel is this, Christ by the Spirit can and does quicken the dead. Christ by the Spirit can and does convert lost sinners. And Christ by the Spirit can revive an ailing, dead, barren, decaying church and Christian. <clears throat> but we need to come before him in prayer and ask him to do it. Amen. So we pray and look for signs of the coming blessing. To put it in this way, how can we as a church look for this answer by water? How can we as a church look for this answer by water? There's Elijah at the top of Mount Carmel. And he's praying and praying and praying again. Is there any sign of this answer by water? Well, the first way is this. One of the signs that the Lord is going to answer by water or spiritual blessing is when he empties you to make you feel the need of that blessing. Do, do you know anything of that this evening? That the Lord is preparing you for something? What does he do? Well, in order to fill you, he empties you first. Maybe some of you are here tonight and you, you think you're full, but... You're not. You're not. You're empty. But the problem is you don't realize how empty you are. Well, one of the signs that the Lord is going to answer by water and bless us spiritually is when he first brings us to see the drought of our soul. I ask you again, do you feel it? Do you know what it is within your own heart to feel dried up and dissatisfied of soul? Dissatisfied with everything that is not Jesus Christ? Or is Christ taking his place somewhere in the background of your life and you're really satisfied with everything else in your life? You pay lip service to Jesus Christ, but you don't need him. You don't want him. There's no conscious reality. There's no sense of emptiness or longing for Christ on a daily basis. He's just over there somewhere, bearing some relationship to your life. If you're satisfied with everything else, if you're satisfied with everything else, so that you do not go empty with a need for Jesus Christ, don't expect that the Lord's going to answer by water. For three years, God broke this sinful and rebellious people. And then he brought the prophet. And out of their sense of barrenness and need, they cried, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. 
God maybe needs to slay all of your idols, all the prophets of Baal that are running around your life. One of the signs that God is going to answer is when he empties you and makes it feel, makes you feel your need and your desire for blessing. It's like a little cloud the size of a man's fist. Another sign is this. When that desire translates into prayer like this. When that desire and sense of need translates into prayer like this. Because sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you feel your need. You might even agree with everything I've said in the last five minutes. But yet you haven't done and you're not going to do anything about it. You're just going to continue eating dust. So here's the other sign. When that desire translates into a spirit of humble, humble and abased prayer before God. Humble prayer, persistent prayer, believing prayer that is not going to stop until it gets an answer. No matter how many nothings are given to you, that believing persistent prayer is going to continue to send hope to look to the horizon for evidence that the Lord is going to return to your soul and bless you. third way you see it is when you receive smaller blessings. Smaller blessings as precursors of greater blessings. That in principle is really an explanation of Elijah's confidence. God had gave him, gave him his word. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he saw on the horizon the beginning of something. It was really small. But yet in it, he believed that he would have not just a few drops of rain and not just a few scattered showers of rain, but that that little cloud was going to grow into one of those heavy black storm clouds that was going to cover the land and they had better get his chariot back to his house before the roads were flooded. When God gives you smaller blessings, oftentimes he gives them to you to stir up your faith and desire and prayer because he has far greater blessings in store. It's one reason why you shouldn't despise the day of small things because they're real blessings. But they remind you that the God has given you them, the God that has given you them, can give you everything else that he promises in his word. And that means you have more to pray for. You have more to pray for. So I want to bring it into the context of our own church life. And you can think of what the Lord has done. Great things, in many ways, we should rejoice in them. In the grander scheme of things, though, they're but like a little cloud the size of a man's hand. This passage of Scripture says to you tonight, if God has given you this, what else can he give you? What else can he give you? If he can start a church out of nothing, really, in this place, and bring it to where it is now, could we not put our ear to a text like this and listen and begin to hear a sound of abundance of rain? That the Lord might say, there is so much more that I can give you. But like Elijah, you've got to stand upon the word, go to God in Christ and pray and pray and pray and pray again. Or maybe God has blessed you in your own personal life. And you've tasted something of the sweetness of heavenly things recently in a way that you hadn't before or hadn't for a long time. Well, don't sit down and rest upon your ease. 
Even that is like a little cloud the size of a, hand's ma a man's hand in comparison with the full cloud and the abundant rain of spiritual blessing that you can enjoy in Christ. God is the one who has answered by fire in his son. In doing that, he has given you a mercy seat. And when you go to that mercy seat, he answers you by these rivers of living water as he gives to us the Holy Spirit who is, enabled, who, who is able to equip us for the whole of our Christian life and godliness. Brethren, may the Lord give us ears to hear a sound of abundance of rain. May he answer you and us together as a congregation by water in these terms. May the Lord bless his word to all of our hearts.